grand scale applications down to the nanoscale, thinking about how we can control matter um, and this concept essentially of, you know, so what Tom talked about was clean energy and air and kind of macro scale uh, methods of, of trying to manage that. And what I'm going to focus on is atomic precision. Um, so uh, uh, also a little bit of backstory on this. Um, Dave, David Forrest is uh, a program officer at the Department of Energy. Um, he was actually supposed to give this talk on nanotechnology, but he couldn't make it. So I have taken some of his uh, content that I found online and merged it with some of mine from a previous presentation that I have given. So uh, bear with me. OK, a little bit of background. Uh, this is my who is this guy slide. So some of you guys know me, some of you don't. So I wanted to give you just a really quick background about who I am. Uh, I did my PhD with uh, Professor Fraser Stoddart at Northwestern. I know we've got a lot of Northwestern alum in the audience. Uh, specifically, uh, what I did is I worked on mechanically interlocked molecules, so things that look like this, and uh, molecular switches and machines, trying to control the movement of molecules um, at, at the very small scales, uh, uh, nanoscale. And so, as an organic chemist, I like to think that we also do atomically precise manufacturing because we stitch together atoms uh, in any manner that we want. Uh, my favorite line on that is, if you give us enough time and money, we can make whatever you want. So. Um, okay, and then uh, as a postdoc, I worked for uh, Professor Jeremiah Johnson uh, as, uh, at MIT, uh, who is just a brilliant uh, organic materials chemist and a recent uh, ACS COPE scholar, 2019. And the specific uh, aim of my research was uh, polymer methodology and drug delivery, which has now led me to my own group at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I, I really can't find a good spot to not block people's view. Um, let me take Tom's approach and come over here. Um, and so what we're interested in is uh, stimuli responsive materials, making precise uh, polymers that respond to different uh, stimuli, uh, light activated artificial molecular muscles, uh, so getting things to have uh, autonomous uh, uh, function. So if you shine light on it, put energy into a system, get it to change its shape, its size, its mechanical properties, and be able to do work. Um, and then we're also interested in polymer-based drug delivery. So thinking about uh, doing, uh, uh, administering different combinations of drugs for treating multidrug resistant bacteria as well as cancer. Uh, we also look at chronic kidney disease therapies as well with the med school at WashU. Um, and then last but not least, looking at uh, introducing the mechanical bond, which is what's referred to when you see, uh, when you have two rings that are interlocked, you think about a, a chain, uh, a normal everyday chain that has these links um, those, are, those links are mechanically bound together, but they're not, that's, that's not one single monolithic piece of metal. It's a bunch of individual building blocks that makes that chain. And so our interests are uh, looking at putting these types of, of mechanically interlocked molecules into three-dimensional polymer networks and then looking at their macro-scale properties as a function of molecular tuning and modularity. Okay, so back to uh, atomic precision. Um, one of the things, so I stole this from David's slide uh, from a, a, a workshop that was on integrated nanosystems for, for APM at UC Berkeley about three and a half years ago. Um, and so atomically precise manufacturing is any manufacturing technology that provides the capability to make atomically precise structures, components, and devices under programmable control. And then integrated nanosystems is interconnected mechanical and electromechanical nanoscale devices and nanoscale structural components that operate together to perform a particular task under programmable control. That is a mouthful, but um, I will elaborate a little bit more on the second uh, portion. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the APM. Uh, I think David would have uh, focused a little bit more on the first portion, but I want to highlight a couple of really cool examples of atomically precise manufacturing um, and then get into how can we take this really cool uh, molecular nanotechnology um, and, and be able to, to integrate these systems and to, to try to get uh, a greater function and, and looking to nature is kind of an inspiration for this. Okay, so this is again directly from uh, David's uh, slides. I, I'm very good at screenshotting things that I find on the internet. Um, that sounded bad, but uh, what I mean by that is looking at uh, this, this slide here um, from, from David where he talks about uh, carbon structures or allotropes of carbon uh, that have defects, right? And when we do manufacturing, we, we ma manufacture things that are not precise, that are not perfect, and they have defects. And those defects do have, uh, can play a role in terms of the structural performance and, uh, of the material. And so in this particular example, um, you have different uh, types of defects that could be introduced into, uh, let's say, a carbon nanotube or 
uh, even thinking about the unrolled version uh, for, for Paul's uh, sake, the, the graphing or graphing nano ribbons. And then looking at this plot of a stress strain curve that just basically describes uh, the number of defects and how it can pertain to the, the, the tensile strength of a particular material, the stiffness and Young's moduli and so forth, um, how defects can uh, obviously decrease uh, the durability and robustness of materials. And so this is another uh, chart that I actually liked in one of his presentations. I think he shows this one a lot, uh, which is basically looking at tensile strength of iron, copper, diamond, aluminum oxide, silicon carbide, polyethylene polymer, cellulose, and sodium chloride. And in each of these cases, uh, we're doing typical uh, types of, of fabrication, and we get metals um, or, or polymers that have a certain tensile strength, but theoretically, if we could do atomically precise, precise manufacturing, we could improve the tensile strength of all of these properties uh, uh, by quite a bit, right? And so uh, there's, there's potentially a lot of uh, uh, potential applications here that, that could be had if we had the ability to uh, manufacture materials in a very atomically precise manner. So I like to uh, show this example from Alex Zettel, who's also a, a former Feynman Prize uh, winner uh, from the Foresight Institute, I think it was in 2013. Um, this, he, his group is uh, based in the Department of Physics at UC Berkeley, and, and uh, just, they just do some amazing things in terms of the scale and the function of what they create using carbon materials. And so what you're looking at here is kind of a, a cartoon or a GIF uh, where they have a carbon nanotube, and this is an indium-type nanoparticle, and they apply an electrical current uh, in, in either direction, as indicated here by the, the, this cartoon and this GIF. And what happens is you get uh, basically disassembly of a particle and mass transport along the conductive nanotubes and then reformation of said particle at a different location uh, depending on the electrical current that's applied. So this is atomically uh, precise mass transport and manufacturing, uh, which I thought was uh, a really, really cool uh, example of this. And so you're, you're basically draining off uh, particles on this side and then transporting them over and then you can flip a switch and go back. Uh, which is what is indicated here in these TEM images. So, uh, really cool uh, example of how um, you know we can we can uh, transport atoms uh, to different locations along these tracks. Um, also, I want to give a shout out to to Joe and a lot of the work that he's uh, done on this. This is also again from David's presentation in terms of taking a a silicon surface and uh, and using uh, a different type of uh, a probe microscopy, a force microscopy, to pull off these different hydrogens, so depassivating these surfaces, um, and then uh, doing epitaxial growth with uh, uh, silane radicals, basically depositing back and then removing these, these white spheres, which are the hydrogens. And so building up these 3D structures uh, with uh, atomically precise manufacturing techniques, um, I think is really cool. Uh, it's very difficult to do to have that level of control, um, but that's kind of, that's the point, right? That's what we're trying to do here. It's what we're trying to achieve is to, uh, you know, we can make materials. The materials are functional. Um, we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of plastics in the world. We all know this, um, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of intellect in this room. There's a lot of chemists in this room that can think of uh, making polymers that are sustainable, right? Have the ability to depolymerize. We, we spend all this time on the forward direction trying to work on the mechanism for polymerization and very little time on the reverse direction. And so that, there's a lot of need there, and there's a, a lot of people now that are, that are working in this, this area. So, okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit, and this is uh, based now talking specifically about um, essentially uh, integrated molecular machines and nanosystems. How can we take your body, which is mostly water, and connective tissue, which is not atomically precise, right? But embedded in that in non-atomically precise environment are molecular machines, biomachines that are atomically precise, that have perfect polymer structures, primary structure, secondary structure, and so forth, and have the, the uh, uh, perfect uh, 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 pockets for molecular recognition events to occur, for example, in enzymatic catalysis or, or transformation of particular small molecules. Um, it's just amazing. But again, when we think about materials, the side of things, um, materials are, we can make them very robust. I can make you a polymer metal composite blend that outcompetes, you know, skeletal uh, uh, bone mass, right? I can, we can make airplanes that can fly uh, faster and higher than any bird has ever done before, right? So there's, there's, there's pros and cons to the different sides, there's different perspectives of the discussion, I should say, um, in terms of this, but is there a way that we can kind of merge these two together? Can we? design and build complex artificial molecular machines on par with nature's 
elegant systems, right? To have precision in terms of structure and function and then relate that to macro scale. So uh, I like to really highlight this and pretty much, I, th I do this at the start of my class. I teach a, a course in synthetic polymer chemistry at WashU. And I, I like to start off with something, especially a lot of the students, they're very, uh, very med school bound, right? The majority of my class are people, students that want to go to med medical school. So I say very right off the bat, you know, DNA, or nature is the polymer chemist, right? And DNA is a prime example of this, right? You have precise programming of sequence and molecular recognition and self-assembly that then packages our genetic information in such a way that you can uh, replicate and translate this into a variety of different functional biomolecules. And so um, very simple uh, chemistry, actually. If you think about the monomer library to make these types of polymers, it's actually not that vast, right? It's very, very small. And if you think about proteins and peptides, it's 20 amino acids. So we have a really, really small library, but yet the variability um, and, and the amount of, of, of information that can be stored in these types of biomolecules is, is off the charts. So in order to break these types of hydrogen bonds, you have to apply heat or some basic conditions. Um, or you can just use DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is uh, uh, an amazing uh, molecular machine that has the ability to split the DNA strand into and then start replicating these different uh, components of the strand and essentially uh, duplicate and replicate uh, your genetic code. Um, you might be familiar with polymerase chain reactions or PCR uh, that has a similar uh, mindset where you use heat. Uh, so you thermally uh, disassociate or denature these two strands, introduce your primer strands, and then introduce some sort of uh, polymerization or polymerase uh, enzyme to amplify uh, uh, DNA, right? So this is, if you think about forensic science, this is something that's used all the time when you have a small sample of, of DNA that you collect, you can amplify that and then you can actually uh, study it analytically. So a uh, very cool uh, collection of, of systems of molecular machines that are working in concert together um, on a substrate to achieve uh, a remarkable goal, which is, uh, again, depolymerizing and repolymerizing and copying uh, genetic information. So it's, uh, it's really cool. Sequence-defined polymers ranging from tens of thousands of millions of base pairs long. Uh, it's just incredibly uh, impressive and uh, has very high turnover number, very robust, um, and, and uh, precision catalysis, if you will. Do what now? So this, that's what this is here. So this is a description of the video, is that you have your incoming DNA strand, you have a helicase enzyme that is responsible for, instead of having to use heat to pull apart the two strands, it's actually an enzyme whose job is to unzip those two strands. And then you have uh, DNA polymerase that where you can bring in uh, free nucleotides and then start, uh, based on complementary base pairing, actually then uh, generate a, a replicate strand that is a mirror image of, of what you just unzipped. And you do this on both, both sides and they're uh, opposite directions because you've got 3-5 and 5-3 uh, type uh, polymerizations. And so the, the point, the take home message here is that you have enzymes, multiple enzymes that are these perfect biological machines that are working together to, to achieve this, this uh, amazing goal. Um, okay, so this is a, another example of uh, nature's uh, biological uh, machinery. This is a kinesin protein that is essentially transporting uh, different uh, biological payload, we'll call it, uh, for simplification purposes. Um, and it's, it's traveling along this microtubule, uh, tubulin type track. And these types of tracks can be uh, synthesized and, uh, yeah, synthesized and, and disassembled uh, in, in whatever direction the payload needs to be delivered with inside the cell. And so this is a, a remarkable example of self-assembly and mass transport or payload transport uh, that's based on using uh, these types of tubulin, alpha and beta tubulin dimers and using these kinesin proteins. And so there's a lot of different types of, of motors for transporting different types of, of cargo. Um, I'm going to see if I can speed up a little bit in the interest of time. Um, and so this is just based on energy release from ATP, adenosine triphosphate, to dye, mono, and eventually adenosine, and all the released phosphate. So every time you cleave one of the phosphate bonds, you actually get, um, you get transport of, of these materials down these microtubulin pathways. And so um, a very remarkable uh, function, multiple components working together at the nanoscale to achieve a much larger goal, right, macroscopic transport. Okay, so uh, in 2016, um, the uh, Royal Society of Chemistry um, in uh, uh, Sweden uh, decided to uh, uh, 
basically select molecular machines for uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, J, Sir J. Fraser Stoddard, Jean-Pierre Sauvage, and Ber, uh, Ben Faringa, as we call them, uh, won the Nobel Prize for their efforts, uh, 30, 35 year efforts in this area in terms of, of developing, using organic chemistry to make molecular machines, right? So bringing organic chemists into the nanotechnology uh, uh, realm of, of, of science and research. Um, and, and so um, one of the primary uh, ways they were able to do this is by introducing what is called the mechanical bond into molecules, right? So you think of linear polymer chains. If I just connect a bunch of little uh, molecules together into a linear strand, I've got a polymer. But if you can actually um, uh, use what is called a mechanical bond, where you actually have two rings that are interlocked, like I mentioned earlier in the chain example, the chain links, um, but they're not actually uh, attached to one another. It's just a through space interaction or something that's like a rotaxane where you have a dumbbell and a macrocycle that can transfer, uh, trans translate effectively down the strand. Um, then you have the ability to program motion using organic chemistry and external stimuli uh, in small molecules. And so um, we've seen a lot of these in our everyday lives. You think about the Olympic rings or uh, sort of abacus where you can actually count uh, these different uh, things. These are all based on uh, topologies that are, that are well known, uh, mechanically interlocked structures. And so this is uh, one of the famous examples from the Stoddart lab where they were able to uh, do all of the synthesis to make this track um, that has these stoppers on the end such that the macrocycle cannot fall off the ends of this particular track. And then using acid and base, they could trigger the activity of this macrocycle back and forth on demand, uh, whereas in, uh, uh, under basic conditions where there's no, this is not protonated, um, it'll, it'll sit and reside on the main uh, electron donor system. And so being able to control molecular motion and so now they have much more sophisticated systems where they're actually making artificial molecular pumps where you can take the macrocycle and thread it onto one end using uh, some radical chemistry and then basically turn off that radical chemistry and have it overcome this secondary steric barrier. And so you can actually load these, these rings and store them, right? So that, if you look at these rings, each one of them has four positive charges. Should be very electrostatically repulsive, it is. If you put a bunch of them in concert and store them along a strand, um, you're, you're definitely going to raise the potential energy and the columbic repulsion of that system. And so um, one of their dreams is to be able to make um, much longer polymer strands and load on many, many of these and maybe even use these tracks as uh, ways to, to transfect things into cells and to go across cell membranes and to transport cargo along tracks um, in, uh, from an external environment into an intracellular one. Okay, so this is uh, Ben Faringa's work here, which is based on uh, the, what he terms a molecular motor, which are basically molecules that can spin um, in a unidirectional fashion uh, in response to light or heat. Um, and this was a, uh, a really uh, cool example that was published in Science just a couple of years ago where they could actually have uh, this, this larger binaphyl system, naphthalene, uh, go around the, the lower uh, fluorinyl half. Um, and so you can get this rotation about um, a core axes, and, and so they're really interested in using this in a lot of different types of applications in materials as well as uh, drug delivery. Um, they also made motor cars, so this is actually really cool. If you can get the stereo isomer correct and lay that down on a track, you can actually apply an electrochemical stimulus via some sort of uh, STM tip um, and actually get this to move uh, across a surface and actually get these wheels to turn. Uh, so that was one of their uh, big uh, kind of uh, uh, headline-grabbing um, discoveries. And then uh, Jim Tour's group, uh, not long after, uh, showed that you could actually anchor these types of motors in, onto a cell membrane surface um, and then via light activation activate that motor and get it to, to destabilize that membrane and actually put pun punch holes into the membrane. Um, and, and so you can sort of see this in these images, these confocal images here where you can see these little dots, these localized punctate dots, or basically localization of these uh, motors getting through the cell membrane and into the cell and actually killing cancer um, doing this. So, so people are looking for applications uh, very much so um, now that the chemistry, the synthetic chemistry and the understanding of how these things work is, 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 is growing, right? They're, they're get, gaining a greater understanding leads to more function and application. Um, but a lot of fundamental science had to get, get to this point. 
Oh, that's perfect, yeah. Um, and so this is a, another example of using synthetic chemistry. This is David Lee's peptide synthesizer. So you put this macrocycle around here that has a little functional group on it and it basically effectively can go through and pick up different types of amino acids along the track and then uh, eventually propagate and fall off of the track and then you have a sequence defined uh, peptide. He has a really cool uh, cartoon or GIF on his website that he uses so they, they describe how they self-assemble uh, these different components and then activate the ring such that it can actually then go through and pick off each of these particular amino acids and make uh, different peptide sequences. So it's, uh, you know, they, they make the argument that this is a artificial ribosome or a synthetic ribosome uh, to be able to, to manufacture precise sequences of these. Um, okay, so um, one of the challenges in the field is um, we've got precise biomolecular machinery, we have uh, precise synthetic machinery, um, how do we scale this? Um, how do we get this to a scalable level uh, where it can be useful? Um, so in terms of uh, material design and level of integration, you've got a lot going on over here. Um, and it's, got, it's pretty robust, I would argue. It's a, yes, it's soft materials, but it, the turnover rate of these is quite high. Um, and so down here we have our switches and motors. Um, we've got uh, some examples. Um, uh, this is uh, from Carson Bruns and Matt Francis's group at Berkeley where they conjugated a rotaxane to proteins. Um, and then you've got molecular level assemblers and things like that from, from David Lee's group um, and of course nanocars. So you're getting more complex and, and more integration but um, still kind of proof of concepts, right? Not quite at the level where you're, um, you're, you're able to make materials that you can commercialize uh, and manufacture. But um, what I'm trying to basically um, indicate here is that we need to start thinking about how to take the next step. What is that next leap, right? How do we how do we take the knowledge that we've gained over the last 40, 50 years in developing these, these systems and having the ability to do atomically precise manufacturing, how can we then um, move forward? And so can we take each of these types of systems and make an integrated uh, machine, right? And have their functions complement one another as opposed to being contradictory. Um, you know, obviously I'm being a polymer chemist, I think that, uh, and if you ever wanna, what is it? Uh, you might know this, Alex. Stuart Rowan likes to use this quote. Um, I like uh, big ass molecules because they give me big ass responses that I can see with my own eyes, right? So if you want scalability and you want to do things in the macro scale, um, you need to use polymers, right? To translate some of these molecular level events up to the macro scale. And so use of polymers and metal composites and different systems, um, and, and then maybe a, a combination of natural proteins and enzymes and artificial molecular machinery. So. I heard some people are very interested in merging the biological interface with the synthetic interface and, and then seeing what properties may ensue. So what say you? And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I think I was on time, even with the technical difficulty. Yeah, no, um, it was perfect. Um, and so now we are going to get into lunch, but before that, we are going to do group. Oh yeah, sorry, completely forgot the questions. Yes, Patrick. Yeah. Um, so two related questions. Um, do you have an estimate of the relative energy loss through uh, heat dissipation currently between biological systems and molecular manufacturing? And the other one is, is there any use of electron transport chains um, in nanotechnology currently? So the first question is an excellent question, and I don't think anybody really has the answer for that in terms of, because um, you've got to think about the differences in scale, right? When you think about small molecules and their relatively simple molecular motions versus proteins and enzymes and these types of things that you saw, the right. DNA polymerase, much larger. But I, you could do the calculation, sure. I, I personally have not done it, um, and I don't know if anybody has, but that's actually, that would be a really interesting uh, you know, physical review of, of the relation between the artificial systems and the natural systems. Sorry, the second one was electron. Electron transport chains. Yeah, so there, I mean, electron transport is obviously very important, right? You think about energy storage, you think about batteries and so forth. Um, my group is interested in that to an extent as well. We make redox responsive polymers that do respond to electrons and trying to propagate the, the, the mechanism of reduction through the material and, and get macro scale changes in shape and size and mechanical properties. So there are people that are looking at it for sure. Um, and, and we're sort of one of them, but maybe not necessarily in the exact way that you're thinking, um, but yeah.
So what's the state of the art now in terms of how many times you can, can cycle now if you need to get to, to thousands and um, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's the robustness now, I guess? Of the artificial molecular machines? Yeah. Yeah, so if you think about the Faringa motors, those things can, can rotate thousands of times per second, right? And they're very fast, uh, very robust, and actually um, one of the few, like, scalable, I would say, scalable types of, of molecular machinery um, because sometimes, a lot of times the catenanes that I showed, the two interlocked rings and the rotaxanes, are synthetically laborious. Um, and so there are multiple steps, and so you're, you're not making a ton of the material. So that's definitely one of the drawbacks and limitations of it. Um, but in terms of the Faringa motors, um, they can often make several grams, if not tens of grams. I'm sure they could scale it even more if they were to commercialize it. I know he's, uh, Faringa himself is doing a lot of this, this, this work and is very interested in that. But they've done things where they, they mix Faringa motors with liquid crystals, right, different types of uh, mo small molecules, and then shine a particular wavelength of light and get changes in pattern um, in that particular material. And so that might be useful, right, in terms of liquid crystalline displays and so forth. Um, so that I think the Faringa motors might be, in terms of scalability, robustness, turnover, and things of that nature, I think they're probably ahead of the curve in the field. Yeah. State of the art, so to speak, as you said. Yeah. Bless you. Thank you. All right. Um, maybe one last question. Great. Between what you laid out and what Tom laid out, there seems to be a gap in my mind. I'm wondering if maybe Correct. I can talk about, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why we're here. Uh, what are like the direct applications you'd say that are promising in terms of these assemblies? Yeah, so I mean, you're, you, you hit the nail right on the head, right? That this is exactly why, um, you know, you'd have this type of title, right? Is that this is not an easy challenge. Um, but uh, for example, let's look at uh, the example of the cell agriculture, cell based agriculture that Tom was talking about, right? Instead of having this top-down approach where I'm going to grow and spend all the, invest all these resources in, in, in generating cattle and then slaughtering them and throwing away a lot of the, the components and just keeping the, the meat, so to speak, literally and figuratively, um, taking a bottom-up approach, right? How did, they, how did they do that? How are they able to do that? Well, it's because they have a molecular level understanding of how to do chemical biology and how cells combine and then those cells then propagate and then layer and make tissues, right? So this is an off, this, so having, so being able to translate, so they're literally translating cellular uh, materials up to macroscopic meats and things that, um, that you can eat, right? And so um, uh, one particular area where this is really, uh, people might be very interested in as you think about cancer, right? So if you think about the natural biological pathways of your body, cells propagate, right? Everybody in this room is a different size. They have different sized organs. How does your body know how to stop growing those organs, right? there's a certain program that's been designed in order in your genetic information that says how tall you're going to be, how big your organs are going to be, and so forth, and then it stops. Well, cancer does not know that. It does not have that blueprint. It just continues to bypass all of those checkpoints and continues to grow uh, without, with aban without abandon, and so, or with reckless abandon. And so how do, we, how do we stop that? How do we understand that? How do we cut that off, right? So you can think about it from a different perspective of having uh, molecular uh, understanding and, and, and chemical biology to, to treat diseases and things of that sort. But the gap that you're referring to is, is very real. Um, you know, it's very hard sometimes to talk to somebody that does large-scale manufacturing, builds robots, right, at MIT, and they're like, okay, I can see this. I can see the wires. I can see the screws. I know how to put this thing together. I can program the software. And then they talk to a chemist, and the chemist is like, well, I program things too, but I do it at the molecular level or the atomistic level like Joe does. Um, and so it's, it's, that's, that's really the challenge. And I think that's the main focus here is how do we go, how do we bridge these two, these two areas? So it's a great question. It's, I think it's why we're here. Could, could I speak to that just real quickly? Um, sure. Uh, th there's, when Jack Kilby first designed integrated circuits and made, made them possible, somebody asked him, well, what are these going to be good for? Yeah. And the best answer he could come up with at the time is, oh, he thought maybe they could control kitchen appliances, which turns out they have, but they've gone a lot beyond that. When Bell Labs was trying to develop transistors, they were trying to develop transistors to replace the relays in their switching stations. Part of what the community needs to do is first have people like yourself, like ourselves, that are trying to build a new way of fabricating useful things. And, and, and we don't necessarily have to know the, the perfect application of it. We're providing tools to other folks to come along to pick them up 
and figure out how to use them. And so we don't always know how they're going to be used. But you pointed out in David's point, there's huge gains that can be made by doing atomically precise stuff. Uh, and it's not necessarily up to us to figure out exactly what the best uses are. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's another great question, right? Is, is do you do applied research or fundamental research, right? Sometimes, so, I mean, so in that review article that I cited, I wrote about these molecular machines with Chad Merkin. And one of the, the intro is all about how the field of electrical motors got started, right? And it was, there's a quote that I pulled from an old paper that's like 150 years old, or not quite 150, I guess about a, a, almost a century. And uh, the author said, it's, he even wrote this to the editor, he said, it's not very clear what this might be useful for. Um, at this stage, it's more or less basically a toy. And th those are his words, right? The scientist, the engineer, the author that wrote that to the editor. And then little did we know that that was literally the first example of an electrical motor ever, right? That then became everything that we see today, right? In cars and, and phones, everything, right? And the, the first computer, was as big as this room, right? I, there's some IBM fo folks here that could probably speak to this a lot better than I can. But, I mean, we didn't have a very good grasp on how to manufacture things. Uh, I mean, that's a supercomputer back in 1950, your cell phone, right? And people just, just conceptually could not wrap their minds around something like that. But if you change the way you think about uh, innovation um, and you use the skills that you have and come to places like this and integrate with people that have skill sets that are completely orthogonal to your own and give you a completely different perspective of how the world works, um, amazing things can happen. I, I would just like to point out the difference what this gentleman pointed out between the gap between what Tom was talking about and what you're talking about. There is a big gap. Yep. Um, but if we were going to go away from uh, an oil-based economy and solve Tom's problem, say, uh, you're still talking at the molecular level, and I think at some point we have to start thinking about the nuclear level. And uh, you know, the thing that comes to my mind is nano nuclear. Mm. So we got all this nano expertise, but we're still working at a molecular level. Wouldn't it be interesting if we start exploring, you know, what's going on at, at, in nuclear chemistry uh, and the possibilities within that realm to get us off a carbon-based uh, uh, economy? Yeah, so that's an excellent point. Some of my colleagues at WashU would agree with you absolutely up, straight up and down because they're nuclear chemists and they always like to say that they are the ones that work on the natural products. They work on the God particles, right? So um, the simplest building blocks to atoms and, uh, and a lot of them, uh, our legacy in our department is a lot of them were nuclear radiotype chemists that actually, unfortunately, some of them worked on the Manhattan Project and they're, um, but that's the level of, of, of research background in our department. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, now I'm definitely not the right person to answer to, to go beyond the atom level, but there are phys physicists and, and, and scientists that are doing that, or they're searching th to that level, right, to that degree, to create new atoms, to create new materials um, that have different function and structure. Absolutely, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Well. Now you know you have big challenges to tackle, so uh, you'll be able to replenish yourself a little bit before uh, taking that on. But before, you will follow Alison outside for the group picture. <laughs>